So I've presented um, a bunch of empirical evidence showing that um, prices and wages are quite rigid. Uh, there seem to be a lot of um, rigidity if you look at uh, nominal wages, if you look at real wages, we saw that a bunch of workers of nominal wage freezes year to year, real wage freezes year to year. Um, with prices, we also saw that prices don't respond. Uh, I mean, we saw that you know prices remain at the same level for a good amount of time, several months, almost a, several quarters even, almost a year. We saw that more importantly, prices don't respond fully to underlying shocks. Same thing with wages. We saw that wages don't respond fully to underlying um, shocks. Um, so now what we're going to do is um, come back to our model of Slack and assume price norms that capture this idea that they, you know, there are a lot of constraints on how wages and prices move. So the price and wage norms that we'll assume would be such that uh, prices and wages, you know, don't respond fully to uh, underlying shock and are, you know, moving in a very sluggish fashion, exactly like what we saw in the real world. Um, so let's start with our very simple model of Slack that we've been uh, covering. So here there is only one price that matters, it's the price of services that are sold on the matching market. Um, and to make the starkest assumption, uh, because we saw that prices, you know, don't respond fully to shocks. Here we're going to assume that our price is completely fixed. We'll solve the model with a fixed price. Um, you know, we'll look at the properties of the solution, make sure that the solution exists. We'll look at comparative statics, and then I'll show you that in fact, down the line, you know, even if we assume that the price is not fixed, but if we assume that the price don't respond fully to underlying shock, all the property of the uh, model will be the same as uh, the property of the model with a fixed price. So in fact, it, the fixed price model is quite useful because qualitatively, any price that's not fully flexible will lead to the same property as a fixed price. Um, so any price that's not fully flexible, you know, if you're only looking at qualitative properties, comparative statics, you'll get exactly the same result if you, have, if you have assume a fixed price. These, these, these properties only disappear once you assume a perfectly flexible price. So the perfectly flexible price is really a knife hedge case that leads to qualitatively very different um, property. But everything that's not purely flexible, fully flexible, will in fact look like a qualitatively like a fixed price uh, model. So. Uh, how are we going to uh, how are we going to do this? So we're going to assume uh, that the price for services is fixed. So the price norm that we assume you remember the price of services given by price norm. The price norm that we assume is that oops, <coughs> P n, which in general depends on tightness is just equal to some price P. And this price P here is just a parameter of the model. It becomes a parameter uh, that we assume. OK, so um, in a world like this, what's, uh, let's solve the model. So you remember, the, at the end of the day, solving the model just boils down to finding the tightness, because once we have the tightness, we can get everything else. So we need to find the tightness x. Now, what is our tightness uh, given by? Uh, well, we saw that the tightness is implicitly given by an equation, which states that aggregate demand has to be equal to aggregate supply. So y t of x and in fact p. So in general, it depends on the on the price norm, but here it's a fixed price. So y t x p is equal to y s of x. Uh, and so this equation, uh, which is, says that AD equals AS, it implicitly 
defines x because indeed I don't have an explicit expression for the tightness, but uh, implicitly the tightness is the solution of this equation. Um, so what is ys uh, here? Uh, so I can plug in uh, our thing. So yd of xp, uh, we had showed that this was uh, key, the utility parameter, epsilon utility parameter, one plus tau x, this is from a previous lecture, tau x, um, the matching wedge, epsilon minus one, times u over p, where p is your fixed price here, has to be equal to f of x times k. Uh, and this is valid uh, both, so here I should say, so this is valid both in uh, the representative agent model and the heterogeneous agent model uh, and k here so that's the key parameter that aggregate capacity. So it's a total amount of services that could be produced. The mu that we have here um, that um, aggregate wells, nominal wells, right? And then you recognize uh, f of x, um, the selling probability, tau x, the matching wage. Um, Okay, so here P is our fixed price. This is our selling uh, probability, and this is our matching wedge. So the wedge between um, consumption and uh, purchases, and then key and epsilon here and here, these are just utility uh, parameters. Okay, so this is the equation that I have to uh, solve. Oh, something that I should maybe also mention. So f of xk on this side of the equation, so this is the AS curve. So this gives us, you know, the amount of services that are sold given capacity and the matching uh, process. And this is what we had called the AD curve. Now remember that the this is really like a, a this is a what we could call a pure aggregate demand and in fact it's not the amount of services that the household would like to purchase at a given tightness um, because the amount of services that the household would like to purchase at a given tightness uh, depends both on uh, their endowment of wealth, but you remember it also depends on the aggregate supply because it depends on their income, you know, that's just a version of sales law. Um, and so how much they want to uh, purchase this kind of behavioral equation that says for a given tightness, I want to purchase this many services. This mix up the demand side and supply side, the supply side comes in because households uh, have a ma you know, marginal propensity to spend out of income and their income is given by the supply side of the model. Um, and so to clean that up and to have a, a, a something that captures purely the demand side of the model, you know, we had to reshuffle the terms in our uh, solution system, and we got at the end uh, this aggregate demand curve, this, which captures pure aggregate demand, so it's aggregate demand once we purge it from the supply side. Uh, so, um, and a way you can also get it is if you take your kind of aggregate demand equation and then you assume that demand equal to supply and that allows you to substitute out supply, uh, then you will also get you will also get that equation. But basically it's how much the household, it comes from the utility maximization, but once we've purged that from the supply side. Uh, that's why I call this a pure aggregate demand. Uh, okay, so here we have our um, solution system. Uh, so we can rewrite it. So here, you know, to, we can rewrite it to try to find the tightness. Uh, because um, I'm going to rewrite it to show you that in fact, that tightness always, uh, always exists and furthermore is unique, which from what we have here is not totally obvious. So I'm going to bring the right hand side uh, to the left, so we'll get key epsilon, one plus tau x, 
epsilon minus 1, mu over p minus f of x times k equal to 0. So this is our tightness equation. And what I want to show you is that this equation will always have a solution. That solution is unique, which will tell us, therefore, that our model always, we can always solve it. Um, and the solution is going to be unique. So how do we know this? Uh, well, we're going to proce proceed in uh, just a few steps. Um, so what do I know? What do I know here? So what happens when x is equal to zero? Uh, f of x uh, when x is equal to zero that's equal to zero. Tau of x when x is equal to zero, uh, we know that that's going to be equal to actually uh, just rho over one minus rho, where rho is a matching uh, the matching cost. So this is something that we saw. Um, so what we learned from that. Let's, let's say that I call this function here. Uh, let's say that I'm just going to call this function lambda of x. So let's write this lambda of x is equal to zero. Uh, so what I learned from this is that lambda at zero, where lambda is just everything that's on the on the left hand side here, uh, lambda of zero, therefore, is going to be key epsilon rho 1 minus rho epsilon minus 1 mu over p minus 0. And so that's uh, strictly positive. Okay, that's the first result. So this equation, when it, uh, tightness is equal to 0, is strictly positive. OK, so then what happens now when x, the tightness, is equal to xm? And xm, you, it's this tightness where tau of x is infinite. Uh, f of xm. That's just a positive number. Um, so lambda of xm, where lambda again is just the left hand side of the equation. Uh, so you have 1 plus tau x, that's going to be infinite. L epsilon minus 1 is positive. So uh, key epsilon divided by 1 plus tau x, epsilon minus 1, that's going to be 0. And so lambda of xm is just going to be minus f of xm times k. And that's going to be strictly negative. OK, so now this lambda, which is uh, the left hand side of the equation, is positive at 0, negative as, as at xm. Lambda of x as a function we also know is continuous. OK, so what I know is that I have a function that's positive at 0, negative as xm, is continuous, so by the intermediate uh, value theorem. What do I know? Well, I know that there is at least one x uh, such that lambda x is equal to zero. Because we know that basically what we know is that lambda is going to take all the values between lambda zero, which is positive, and lambda xm, which is negative. So there is uh, x such that uh, lambda x is equal to zero. Uh, so what why that matters for us? It means that uh, our model has at least uh, one solution. OK, uh, that's by the intermediate value theorem. But furthermore, we know an additional thing is that we know that the function lambda x is strictly decreasing. How do I know that? That's because uh, tau x we know is uh, tau x is uh, strictly increasing. That's because epsilon is strictly greater than one, and that's because f of x is strictly decrease, is strictly increasing. F of x being uh, the selling probability, and so you can if you go back to our expression for lambda that we have here, <clears throat> if tau x here being epsilon minus one is positive, one over one plus tau x epsilon minus one, that's going to be strictly decreasing f of x is increasing, but with minus f of x, that's going to be strictly decreasing. So the whole thing is going to be strictly decreasing. Um, and so because lambda x is strictly decreasing, then we know that uh, the solution of the model 
is uh, unique because once you find that x such that lambda x equal to zero, everything that's smaller than x will be positive, everything that's bigger than x will be strictly negative, so the solution has to be unique. Um, so from that, we learn that uh, x such that lambda x equals zero is unique. And why that matters for us is that because our model solution is unique. So everything is working good here. Uh, we always have a solution and uh, that solution is unique. That's a good thing to know. Um, and so how can we represent it graphically? So one is that we could just uh, represent it using the argument that I've showed here. So here, let's say I put, um, I'm going to put X on my horizontal axis. So I know that I have Xn. Here, I'll have zero here. <clears throat> and so what I know is that when x is equal to zero, uh, I could put lambda zero, <clears throat> which is equal to, as I said, key epsilon, rho one minus rho epsilon minus one, mu over p, so that's strictly positive. And then I know that at xm, Uh, I have my function, you know, I have lambda of xm here, which is minus f of xm, k, and so that's uh, strictly negative. So I know that that xm of function is negative, and I know that my function here is um, strictly decreasing. So it's going to be something like this. And so as a result, you know, you start from something positive, you go to something negative, you're continuous, you know that x <coughs> uh, always exists uh, and is uh, unique. And then, of course, another way to represent it is that to go back to our original uh, AS equal AD. So here, this is just to show you the argument of what I've made of, for why uh, our solution exists and is unique. Then something that's maybe more informative. Uh, We can have another representation of the solution, which is, of course, completely equivalent. Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to have a vertical axis, I'm going to have a horizontal axis. I'm going to put tightness x here. I'm going to put output here. Okay, here, so another way to represent the solution is to go back to our aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply uh, equation. And so we know that the aggregate supply starts at zero and then is increasing. Uh, so this curve that I represent here, that's ys of x is f of x k. Uh, and so I know that uh, out, you know, this is the first equation that I have, and then I can then represent uh, the demand. So here I'm going to put my tightness equal to xm. At xm, I know that the, that the function yd is zero, and then I know that this function is just uh, going to be decreasing. And I know that when Tightness is zero here. Uh, so this, this is just yd of x and p. I know that when, uh, so here at xm I'm completely positive, and here I know that this thing here, uh, 
uh, that's just yt at zero, and we said it's uh, key epsilon divided by rho over one minus rho epsilon minus one divided by mu over p. So this is uh, what we have. And so what we've just shown is, of course, you know, the tightness has to uh, be such that demands equal to uh, AD is equal to AS, and you know AS is strictly increasing, starting at zero. AD is strictly decreasing, starting above zero. Um, and so obviously they are going to, uh, you know, uh, so yes, so starting at a tightness of zero, YD is strictly positive, YS is zero, one is decreasing, one is increasing, one converges to K, the other converges to zero, so they are going to cross at one point and that where they cross is going to be exactly unique, so you can also see it that way. Graphically, you can see that you have a tightness X here, uh, so this is our solution of the model that's at the intersection of AD and AS, and we can see it always exists and is also always unique. You can see it here uh, just graphically. Uh, because at XM, I guess, XM is the highest tightness that you can have where your aggregate uh, demand is still, uh, is just equal to zero, is still positive. Um, and at that point, the aggregate supply uh, is going to be strictly positive. So these two curves are going to curve to cross and they're going to cross only once. Uh, and here we can see directly what is the output in the model. So there'll be another kind of more, another representation that uh, also shows you the uh, unicity. Um, but I guess, you know, implicitly it's using the intermediate value theorem to 